Hello and welcome to a Marketing Sherpa webinar. Today we have an especially interesting story for you today. If you've attended Marketing Sherpa webinars before, what we do is we bring in marketers from all across the world, B2B, B2C, all different types of marketers, bring them here and ask them your questions. Well, we have a really surprising marketer today because when Marketing Sherpa looked all across the world for our optimization summit, I was trying to find some of the most interesting optimization studies. We found it in a very surprising place. As you look at this title, when we talk about how A-B testing generated more than $500 million in donations, there's very few campaigns that are quite that big, especially when we talk about donations. But this is one that everyone on the call is probably exposed to. It is the presidential re-election campaign, a major campaign. We're going to give you an inside story today. Now, I also want to warn you, hey, we know it's a political story. But for just today, let's take off our Democrat hats or Republican hats or independent hats and see how we can learn from a fellow marketer. And that fellow marketer, if I can call you that, Amelia, is Amelia Showalter. She was the director of digital analytics for Obama for America. Thanks for joining us today, Amelia. Oh, of course. I'm Daniel Burstein, the director of editorial content for Mech Labs. I'm in our Jacksonville Beach, Florida office right now, and Amelia's joining us from San Francisco, where incidentally we'll be in a few months for Lead Gen Summit. How is San Francisco today? Uh, it's great. I just uh, flew in this morning, and it's blue skies and, and sunny as can be. Well, hopefully that's a, a nice omen for this webinar, blue skies and sunny as can be. And I want to invite you to participate in this webinar too. Uh, we are asking your questions to Amelia. We got many of your questions before this webinar that we, we pre-populated the slides with. We're going to be looking, we have an entire slide deck of Amelia's keynote from Optimization Summit 2013. We're not following any order. We're going to hop around to all different slides based on whatever questions you ask so we can answer as many of your questions as possible. You can ask those questions through the ReadyTalk platform or you can use hashtag Sherpa webinar to ask your questions and also to impart your own advice on A-B testing and email. Through hashtag Sherpa webinar, I will also be sharing a few other pieces that we've created with uh, Amelia Showalter, along with Toby Falsgraf, another member of her team. We have some case studies. We have uh, some videos, some information on their talk. You can see those resources right here, but we'll be including those on the hashtag as well. So with that, let's jump right into it. And Amelia, so you had a a pretty darn big challenge, right? When you uh, started with the Obama campaign um, in 2008, you guys raised $750 million. You knew that would not be enough for 2012. So we know that uh, A-B testing of email was clearly important. Looking in hindsight, we have a question here from Tulane, who is a consultant. Tulane asks, what strategy changes have you made from the beginning of the first campaign until today as a result of the changes in the digital landscape? Of course, today the, the campaign's over. But I want to ask you, you know, when you started in 2012, you know, the digital landscape had changed a lot since 2008. So what, what were some of the factors that uh, you kept in mind and, and why did you choose to do what you did? Sure. Well, I mean, a lot of what we did was actually just building on what we did in 2008. I mean, certainly in 2008 there was uh, some level of A-B testing um, and segmentation. Uh, but really what we did is we just took it all to a new level. Uh, you know, I think a, a classic example is um, in 2008 when we were asking people for uh, for money in an email. You know, people would get these sort of personalized uh, asks. Some people would get asked for five dollars, and some people would get asked for fifty dollars. And so they would have, you know, maybe four or five different buckets like that in 2008. Um, but in in 2012, we actually we worked on a very complex formula to determine the, the best ask for each person, and basically that ended up. Uh, leading to hundreds of buckets uh, for, for, all the pe for people at all the different levels. So I mean, it, it wasn't as if it was a different concept from 2008, so we would just sort of took everything to the next level. So it sounds to me, segmentation, you guys just blew segmentation out of the water and took it to a whole new level. Yeah, I mean, it's particularly on, on, in, in the ask, uh, you know, in, in uh, segmenting people based on their donation history, we did a lot of that. Although I will say, um, you know, there, we also, uh, people thought that the campaign did a huge amount of segmentation and based on demographics or other sort of, you know, uh, you know creepy variables that we know about you. And that's actually not the case. Um, typically, you know, when we tested uh, messages, we tested, you know, many different versions of the same email, we would send them out to many different uh, small pieces, randomized pieces or a list. And then we would send that winning message out to everyone, and we would find that you know the the message that would win would win among all different demographic groups. So we actually didn't uh, micro target our email uh, program all that much. We did do some little tweaks based on people's past uh, behavior, like how they had been involved in the campaign, 
if they had donated before, if they had volunteered, you know, things like that. But um, it, it, in terms of segmentation, it actually wasn't this, you know, crazy uh, uber micro-targeting that people think we did. Well, th that's interesting. I think a lot of people think that because direct mail for politics seems to be very segmented. I know, like I said, I'm, sure. I'm here in Jacksonville Beach, Florida. It's a swing state. I get a lot of direct mail from uh, political uh, candidates, and, and I can definitely see how they tie into certain of my interests. So why, why did you choose not to micro-target and segment? Well, um, I mean, we looked at the data, and it just, you know, what we found is that, uh, you know, a lot of the variables that we had uh, for, for some people just didn't matter as much as um, finding that good universal message that works for everyone. Um, I think the major thing, you know, my background actually is in micro-targeting, and before I did uh, digital uh, work, I was doing you know, micro-targeting models. But digital, you know, we're just communicating with our supporters. These are people who have already signed up uh, to receive our emails or have, have donated before or you know, are interested in the campaign. And so it was a very different group. Um, it wasn't, we, we weren't using our email program or our, uh, our website to persuade in the same way that direct mail is used to persuade voters. Okay. Well, let's uh kind of start at the end, if you will, and look at the uh, results of this campaign. And so obviously, as we know, for the ultimate KPI, uh, congratulations, you were successful. The president was reelected. Um, but let's take a look at some of the results. Can you tell us about some of the results from the campaign? Yeah, so um, we raised more than half a billion dollars in online donations. That was about half of the campaign's total. So um, as you know, as we, we knew that 750 million total wasn't going to be enough in 2008. Um, the, the 2012 campaign uh, was, was more than a billion dollars, and about half of that was uh, just from the digital department uh, from our efforts. And I believe when uh, yeah, we were talking at Optimization Summit, you said maybe $200 million could be directly attributed to the improvements from A-B testing. Is that correct? Yeah. I mean, it, you know, that's just a sort of really rough estimate. I mean, one thing that, uh, you know, when we're working on the campaign, we actually are working so hard to, to run all those tests that we didn't always keep perfect track of exactly you know what was going what you know what results were uh, long term and you know it, it's hard to calculate all this stuff out when we want to put all of our resources into running more tests so we don't actually ever have a perfect estimate of exactly how much uh, extra revenue was due to our testing but I think that 200 million is a you know a fairly reasonable estimate. Well, speaking of measurements, we have a question here from Jennifer. She is a senior manager. She wants to know your thought on measurement. What is the best metric? Is it click-through rates? Is it conversions? What do you think? Well, for us, we always went directly to donations, or at least if we were looking at donation emails. Um, you know, if we looked, we would, you know, we might look at the opens and clicks, but that was never how we made our decisions. You know, if we were sending out, you know, we usually we'd send out between 12 and 18 different variations of an email. Uh, before sending the winner to uh, to the remainder of the list, and it, we ju we were just looking at donations. Um, it, I think it's just, it, you know I, it's nice to know about clicks and opens, but we want to go directly to the end goal, which um, for a lot of our emails was donations. And you know we used the same method if we were trying to you know for instance get people to volunteer. Um, we would go directly to uh, volunteer sign up. So we would have a sign up page. And rather than just looking at, looking at how many people clicked to, through to that sign-up page, we actually would look at how many people filled out the form and, and committed to volunteer. Okay. Let's take a look at uh, some of those tests now. And so um, in some of those tests you had you know, uh, some small incremental gains, 1% or 2% gain. In this example, a 5% gain. You know, those, those are always good. Um, we had a question here about how you tested and, and who you tested. Uh, Patricia, a senior director of development, wants to know, if there was any pre-qualification before establishing the A-B segment, did you rule out the very bottom, for example, or was it totally random? Um, well, for, for the web, it was really just sort of whoever was coming through to that particular page. Um, for email, we did actually eventually stop uh, running tests to our non-donors, people who had never donated before, um, only because they usually wouldn't respond uh, quickly enough. I mean, obviously, at, at any given email, some people who have never donated before would then convert and become donors. Um, but uh, you know, they, they might not necessarily uh, respond quickly enough for, make, for us to make a decision. So there were some people that we cut out of testing. Um, I mean, another thing, this is you know, it's funny that I'm on the West Coast right now. I'm actually originally from the West Coast. Um, 
and you know cutting cutting out uh, uh, for early morning tests, we would sometimes cut out the people who were on the west coast from those test groups because if we were sending something out at seven a m Chicago time that's five a m east uh, west coast time, and uh, the, you know if we have to make a decision within an hour. You know the people that we're sending to on the West Coast aren't necessarily going to be awake, and so if they're not helping us make a decision, we might as well uh, not not send them all these different variations, most of which are going to be you know middling, uh, and we'll save them just for the winning the winning message. Okay. Uh, another question about how you tested. So if we look at another test you did, it's interesting because you tested <laughs> almost everything, and here you can see on the screen some of the unsubscribe uh, language that was tested. And we had a question about how unsubscribes affected A-B testing. Uh, Kim, who's a senior marketing manager, wants to know, please include any insights as to how inbox delivery versus spam box plays a role in A-B testing and winner selection. So I wonder if when you looked at your results, did you look at any uh, metrics like inbox placement or delivery ratings or anything like that? Uh, not so much. I mean, you know, unsubscribes would be part of it or bounces. I mean, we, you know, it would be a metric we'd look at, but it wasn't, you know, I think a campaign is has less reason to be concerned about some of these things because it's a finite venture. You know, our our campaign was going to be over no matter no matter which way the election went. And so, you know, looking at things like unsubscribes, you know, we we want to prevent unsubscribes whenever possible, but it it's maybe a little bit less of a major metric for for a campaign than it would be for other organizations. And then in terms of of spam, you know. One thing that was very helpful about our switch to testing mostly to donors, people who had already donated before, is that they were much less likely to flag us as spam and they're, they're our very best supporters. So some of that you know, maybe wasn't always intentional, but um, did seem to help. So as we talked about, uh, you tested many different elements. Uh, in this example, you tested, I believe, the, the name that it was sent to and also the amount they donated. So some of these are some really advanced tactics. Elizabeth, who's an executive director, wants to know where the best place to start is, you know, using baby steps. Where would you advise someone to start with A-B testing? Well, I, I do think that um, some of the, I mean, just, you know, you, you do want to take baby steps and just dividing your, your full list into two pieces is clearly, you know, the easiest thing to do. Now, obviously, when you divide your list into two pieces, um, you're not going to have any list left over to send the winning version. So what you want to do is start with start with things that will be useful on the next email that you send, for instance. So, you know, rather than testing things like graphs and subject lines, you know, which are sort of more ephemeral and, and aren't necessarily going to be uh, produce useful information for the next one, you know, maybe you want to test the formatting of your message. You know, on, on the Obama campaign, we found that plainer emails were much better than highly formatted graphics heavy emails. You know, occasionally we would send out graphics and, and sometimes we would send out animated GIFs. Um, but in general we found that just plain white background, you know, not a lot of this extra formatting was better. And I actually think that, you know, maybe people have started to tune out the sort of highly formatted emails. And so that might be a good place for people to start. Um, for one, because it's you know, an interesting thing to test, but also it's something where if you just divide your list into uh, group A and group B and test, you know, your usual uh, email with, that might have, you know, a colored background and, you know, special fonts and graphics and stuff versus a much plainer email, um, you're going to learn something for the next time around. Excellent. And uh, one other thing you learned, and I think this is maybe one of the most interesting tests because it's something we, we get the most questions about, is about you know, how much email you should send. Even you did a little I know on, on when you should send. So let me ask a few questions we had from our audience about this right now. Maybe you can enlighten us about some of the things you learned. Uh, Justina, Director of Development, asked, does it matter what time of the day emails get sent out or what day of the week? What is the maximum of emails an organization should send out in a month and what's the minimum? Uh, Catherine wants to know, can we send too many emails? And Patricia, the always intriguing time of day, day of the week issue. So I think you did some testing to try to get to the heart of both of these questions, right? Yeah, so um, we did a little bit of time of day testing and just never found it very conclusive. Basically, we found that sending really late at night or really early in the morning is a bad idea, but um, other than that, it wasn't, you know, we just didn't get much out of it. Um, you know, we, we, in fact, we tried uh, sending 
you know, to people who had donated at very specific times of day and only those times of day. We tried sending, you know, emails to them at their preferred time of day, and that didn't actually help increase donations. So, I mean, you know, we we did test all these things, and I just my main conclusion is that time of day testing is should be pretty low on your priority list. Like if you have a finite amount of time and staff resources, there are just other more interesting things to test than what time of day to send, is my opinion. Um, in terms of day of the week, you know, we didn't really test that because um, we were sending pretty much all the time. You know, we sent emails pretty much every day. So our calendar was much more determined by the political calendar. So there wasn't much of a we, we didn't really, we weren't really in a position to say, well, okay, let's try t t sending this email on Tuesday and then uh, to half the people, and then the, the same email to the other half on Thursday. It just wasn't something that we could do. Um, but what we did do is this, uh, you know, as you see on the screen, we did some uh, a, a longitudinal test that we called the more email experiment, where we sent, uh, we, we selected a group of people to receive additional emails, uh, and. It just turned out that sending more more fundraising emails got us more donations, um, and the unsubscribes. You know, we, we also had more people unsubscribe, but it wasn't as if it got, went out of control. It was, it's not as if you know sending twice as much email yields four times as many unsubscribes. Um, and basically, this you know what we determined is that uh, at least for our campaign, this may not be true for everyone, but for our campaign in the months that we had left at that point, it was better to just. Send a lot more email, uh, and I, you know, think that it really helped us uh, to the tune of twenty to thirty million dollars in revenue. There is no upper limit to how many emails people want from President Obama, and I love that you put together uh, your team put together this shirt. Four more sends, <laughs> based right, on right, right. Well, because you know, I mean, four four more years was a was a, a rallying cry of the, of the Obama campaign, and so uh, when we determined that it was better to send more email, four more sends became our rally cry. Beautiful. So let's get into uh, subject lines a little. And uh, we have a question here from Jamie who's in operations. And we're going to look at some of these tests. But if you could talk to me at a, about at a high level, if there's any clumping together you can do of your subject lines, uh, what worked and what didn't with subject lines of your email. So I know we're going to talk about some specific subject lines, but is there any types of subject lines that tended to work better than others? Well, we tended to find that shorter subject lines work better, that um, sort of less formal, more personal emails works better, uh, subject lines. I mean, uh, you know, in this particular case that you've got up on the screen, uh, you know, this, this subject line, hey, had been doing really well. We, we, we used that a bunch of times from the President. This was the only time that hey actually lost, and it lost to name, meaning like the person's uh, first name was inserted as the subject line. Um, and that, you know, I guess felt more personal. Um, you know, been now, now I think this is maybe overused, so I'm not necessarily going to recommend this, but um, putting a colon uh, at the end of the subject line, no matter what it is, tends to get people to open it. I kind of feel like that is going to get played out pretty soon because everyone's doing that. Um, so there's, yeah, there's a few little tricks. You know, we, we did for a while, we tried a few of the um, you know, special characters, little uh, you know, icons for airplanes or sunshine or something like that. And you know, it, it sort of works. Uh, but it doesn't work every time, and you know, even though shorter subject lines tend to work, sometimes longer ones would work better. And basically, what it meant is, you know, when we tested these things out and got a sense that something was working, it wasn't as if we would shift entirely to short informal subject lines. We would still test out. We would we might just change the mix. So if we were testing out ten different subject lines, maybe we would have a few more of them be shorter and informal, but we'd still keep. Other other possibilities in the mix, just in case things changed. That, that's interesting. I was just going to ask you as a joke if you tested special characters, but my hat's off to you that you you literally tested everything. Um, so there's a question here from uh, Jeff, a content marketing specialist. Is there any such thing as over testing? I read the Obama campaign, which has three subject lines. If you have a big enough sample, why not test ten? And so I just want to tell people what they're looking at right now. This is a test we're about to look at, where you had three different subject lines you tested but across six different versions of the emails for a total of 18 treatments. So uh, to Jeff's question, I'm sure you had a massive list. I don't know if you can share how big. Um, how would you decide what, what limit to how much you would test? You know, I wish I had the, uh, the perfect answer. Um, I mean, I think a lot of it was that, uh, you know, we had a, a certain number of drafts and subject lines that 
could get written in the amount of time that we had. I and mean, we had a huge team of email writers that were writing all the time. So there was an actual upper limit to the amount of content we could produce. Um, you know, it's, it is a good question. You, know, you, you want to test lots of different options. Um, and we certainly found that you know, we, were really, we weren't very good at predicting which, which option would win, so it was good to try a lot of different things. Um, but you also want to have enough lists left over to send the winner to. So I don't have a great answer for that. I think it's sort of like it, we, we sort of, I don't know, just uh, came to a good, uh, just sort of felt like the right amount. And it, that ended up being about 20% of our list that then that 20% would get broken into many small pieces uh, and, and for all the different versions. Okay, as we said, for this example, there's six versions, three subject lines. I'm, gonna, I'm not going to read each version, but I'm going to briefly quick, click through each version. So it shows up in the uh, YouTube replay, and uh, you can also view the slides here if you want to view each version in general. And then we're going to show the results, and we're just going to show you the winner so you get a sense of what the overall winner was. Um, but first, I did want to thank our sponsor of this webinar, Acton. Um, I'm going to show the results in just one moment, but let me tell you that Acton Software is a leading provider of cloud-based integrated marketing automation software. It was recently named to Ford's America's Most Promising uh, Companies list of the 100 US-based privately held high growth companies with bright futures. Companies of all sizes turn to act on to execute multi-channel online demand generation and lead nurturing campaigns by automating critical marketing tasks and providing rich analytics and reports in real time. Acton's 1,400 plus customers range in size from small and mid-sized businesses to departments of large enterprises across all major industry verticals, including technology, manufacturing, healthcare, and finance. And you can learn more at act-on.com. Dot com. That's act-on.com. Also, I do want to let you know that Amelia was a keynote speaker at Optimization Summit 2013. We are just announcing for the first time, you're the first audience to hear this, Email Summit 2014, one of the biggest email events in the industry, will be in Las Vegas at the Aria Hotel, February 17th through 20th in 2014. Save the date. We do hope you join us for that. And now, as promised, here are the results. So the, the winning treatment, I believe, $2.2 million additional revenue from sending the best draft versus the worst, right? I mean, this is a pretty significant difference. Right. And, even, so yeah, and even if it was just average, even if we just chose one at random, you know, it could be a pretty big difference. And, uh, and, but, and for this one, the winning treatment, uh, just so you know, and you can, again, look, look in more detail through them, where the name was the actual subject. It was personalized for the name. Um, and the, uh, it began, this is my last campaign, and I'm ready to give it all I've got. Did you have any, I don't know if you guys created a hypothesis in the beginning and at the end of the test, you said, here's why this one won, or you were just moving very fast and, and just tried, okay, we just push this winner out, and then we move on to the next winner. No, I mean, we, yeah, we learned pretty quickly to not overthink things. I mean, it, some of this really is ephemeral. It's, it's, you know, it's, and we would, even, we would have draft uh, language it did really well one day, and we would test out something really, really similar a week or two later, and it might not perform well at all. Uh, there's something just sort of, yeah, ephemeral about it. Um, and, and, you know, I mean, there were some things that we kept, we kept testing, and they would win frequently. I mean, you know, for most of the summer of 2012, uh, the, the message that we were going to be outspent by uh, the Republican side that, that was very effective. Um, but eventually that stopped being effective, and so it's good that we kept testing it against other things. So speaking of ephemeral, your subject lines became so popular that this mem got going where um, people added the subject lines to pictures of Ryan Gosling, right? Yeah, there's a Tumblr that's, that, that was started with uh, our subject lines with uh, Ryan Gosling photos. So we want to know, you know, sure, the president, uh, you know, he's kind of known as somewhat of a hip guy, one of the hipper presidents in the United States. And so, yeah, a subject line like, hey, might work for him. But uh, Luke Thorpe, who's actually our AV director here, he's, he's managing this call right now. He mentioned in one of our meetings, well, would hey work for us? And so we had to know, would a subject line, hey, work for a company like us, a bunch of marketing researchers who are anything but hip like the president and certainly can't play basketball like him. Uh, so we tested it. We tried it out. Uh, so Amelia, I, I, this is the, the, the uh, little surprise I wanted to tell you about. Uh, me and Amelia prepped for this call, but I didn't want to show her this. I want to get her reaction to some of our own um, humble tests. Um, so here's our first test. <laughs> well, thank you. We, we wanted to see uh, our first test, a uh, typical subject line, a live webinar about how A-B testing generated 500 million in, do in donations. And we just changed the first line, you know, come see an inside look at, at how this happened. Um, the second subject line was, hey. <laughs> 
<laughs> and uh, we said, tune in to see this Wednesday to see why we use the hey subject line. Now, let me tell you, Amelia, by my own hypothesis before this, I, when Luke had that idea, I wanted to do it because I thought it wouldn't work. So then, well, live on the webinar, I could give you a hard time and say, hey, your, your subject lines aren't working. Um, it's a bit of a joke, but the bigger lesson for the audience being uh, when we're talking about a different subject line or a different specific test that worked for Amelia and the Obama campaign or any specific marketer, uh, we're really less talking about, hey, do this specific thing, write it the same way. We're trying to show you, and, and hopefully we've done that in today's webinar, how Amelia and her team learned about what was working, what wasn't, and the process they used to push that out into their email so you can do that for you. Um, so again, my thought was this would not work at all for our audience, and so I can make that case and give you a hard time, Amelia. Um, but it worked really, really well. <laughs> yeah, we did, we did two experiments, and you can see the numbers on the screen there. We got um, a 33% lift in open rate in one. We got a 50% lift in open rate in the other. We got over 200% increase in click-through on one. Uh, it was, and these are results at a 99% level of confidence. Just, just a quick little experiment. So while my original lesson was, um, you know, you got to test because the exact things that Amelia's telling you won't work for you, well, maybe they will. <laughs> um, but I guess the other bigger lesson I, I really wanted to make is um, you, you can't guess at what will work um, because uh, that's why we test. Right? I, mean, I think you had that challenge too, Amelia, right? Sure. Oh, yeah, sure. I mean, there are things that I sort of, you know, I thought, oh, I have a great idea. I'm sure this is going to work. I'm going to be, you know, doing, uh, I'm going to be the hero because I will have thought of something brilliant. And, uh, you know, then my idea totally failed. And, you know, that was fine. I, I, I'm not so egotistical that I can't uh, take the, the hit to my ego. Um, but, you know, so then we would learn from it and I'd say, all right, why don't we do the opposite of what I just said and let's try that out instead. And so uh, we have a question here. I think it ties in well. Uh, David wanted to know how many, staff man how many staff members manage the actual email building and sending. Do you want to tell us a little bit about your staff and, um, you know, <laughs> one, how, who is better and who is worse at guessing which emails would work up? But you know, seriously, who is kind of involved in, in building this? Yeah, yeah. I've been seeing questions in the chat about, about staffing. Um, yeah, so there were, you know, 15 analysts on my team, and they had, you know, various skill sets. Uh, it was a lot of people with a stats background um, or, uh, you know, a, a database background, not people necessarily who had worked in politics before or even in marketing. We had a couple of people who had done marketing before, but, um, you know, really just I was looking for smart, quantitative people, and we did a lot of on-the-job training. Uh, now, on, on Toby's team, he was the head of the, uh, the email team, and they had 18 email writers and four people doing social media. Um, and I think having all those different voices was really good because, again, you know, we, we tried out four to six different drafts for every national email. And so just to be able to have differences, I think you have to have different people, different, different voices. Um, and that's just, you know, those are just two teams within the digital department. I mean, the, the digital department itself ha had over 200 people by the end of it. So it was really, I mean, you know, and some of those people were doing our online ads and, uh, you know, creating our website and doing our video and YouTube and all of that kind of stuff. So we really had just a huge, huge team just in the, in the digital department, and it was really great to, to have that many people on hand. So we've got about two minutes remaining. Let's take a look at um, a few of your top lessons here. I mean, one, you said, I mean, for you, as, as I think we've definitely reiterated many times this webinar, testing uh, clearly wins. I mean, these are some impressive numbers beyond um, the money raised, you help recruit two million volunteers. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I mean, it was, it was, uh, you know, we, and it was the same exact procedure, same testing methods. Yeah, and you also mentioned um, the use of data. Um, you were not so worried about uh, using a lot of data with your uh, audience. Why? Why is that? You said big data does not equal big brother. Yeah, I mean, I think that this is, you know, uh, it's. An issue, you know, you, you want to be sensitive to, to you want to be, you want to make things personal. You want to, um, uh, you know, use the data that you have uh, from people. And, you know, again, these were our supporters. These are people who, um, you know, had signed up for our email list. They want to be involved. And so, you know, we would do experiments sometimes to look at how to personalize things, how to say, uh, you know, if we sent out an email to people asking people for money, 
you know, and we had a group that had already donated recently, maybe we'd drop a little uh, extra line in there just to say thanks for their, for their recent donation, sort of acknowledging it or acknowledge, acknowledging that they had volunteered or had um, signed Barack's birthday card last year and would, would they like to sign it again this year. So using that data to actually make uh, a, a, an experience more personal because, you know, when you're talking to someone in person, you remember things about them. And so I think that's where, you know, the, the, the data can actually make things more personal, not less. And speaking of that personalization, we had a question here from Michelle. Which test provided the most significant difference, sample, subject line, layout, call to action placement, et cetera? And I think, and I might be guessing wrong now, we've just got one minute less, left, so I want to ask you this. I, I think the, the biggest test was personalization, right? That had the biggest impact on what you did, tying it to the personal amounts that donors gave and those sorts of things, right? Yeah, I mean, it, it sort of depends on your definition of, of impact. I mean, uh, you know, probably that, that running that more email experiment, you know, just to be able to change our policy to send more email, uh, that may have had the biggest impact in terms of, of sheer dollars. Um, but yeah, personalization sometimes would have um, a, a huge percent increase. So, you know, among the people that we were uh, doing those, that personalization to, like that actually, I think in this particular case, uh, the, the slide that we're looking at right now, I think that actually doubled the, the donation rate, which that was pretty unusual. Um, not all, all the personalization had had that great of an impact, but it was you know, pretty amazing. <laughs> Well, this has certainly been a pretty amazing case study, Amelia. Thank you so much for joining us today. I know you've been traveling all over the country, so it's really hard to be able to, to, to fit this into your schedule. Thank you very much for taking the time. Of course. Thank you very much. And thank you, everyone, for tuning in. Uh, we hope to see you at Email Summit 2014. Also, if you can, when, you, when we close out this uh, webinar, there will be a survey. Please fill out the survey. Let us know what we can do to improve these webinars for you. Thank you. Mm -hmm.